Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another one of our Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Scientists webinars. We are really excited to have Katrina Van Grell here. Uh, Bertha just published her website link, unfeatheredbird.com, in the comments section, so you can check out her newest book and her other book, Unfeathered Bird. If you have any comments or questions, we'll be scanning them in the comment section and also in the ask a question tab, which is located at the bottom of your screen. And then at the end, I'll be asking the most popular questions to Katrina. Now, when Charles Darwin contemplated how best to introduce his controversial new theory of evolution to the general public, he chose to compare it with selective breeding of domesticated animals. In her new book, Unnatural Selection, marking the 150th anniversary year of Darwin's great book on domesticated animals, titled Variation Under Domestication, author and illustrator Katrina Van Grell explains why this analogy was incredibly appropriate. Artificial selection is, in fact, more than just an analogy for natural selection. It's the perfect example of evolution in action. Katrina Van Grell, author of The Unfeathered Bird and Unnatural Selection, both published by Princeton, inhabits the no man's land between art and science. She holds degrees in fine art and natural history illustration and is a former curator of the ornithological collections at a major national museum. She's a self-taught scientist with a passion for evolutionary biology and its history. And we are really excited to hear this presentation. And go ahead, Katrina. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for joining me. This is going to be a bit of a learning curve for me. This is quite a weird experience, uh, sitting at home talking to my computer. So you're going to have to bear with me and just wish me luck. But great. Uh, this picture is called The Ascent of Mallard. And this is the title page of my new book, A Natural Selection. And that's a book all about selective breeding. Now, selective breeding isn't the same as domestication. Domestication is what we do to wild animals to make self-perpetuating populations of tame ones. Selective breeding is what happens after that. And it's an ongoing process, never ending process. We take those tame animals and we convert them into populations of animals which are more beautiful, more productive, more interesting, or just plain different. Most of all, though, this is a book and a talk about selective breeding on a far, far grander scale, a scale that actually encompasses all life on Earth. But we know it by a different name. We call it evolution. Now, many of the evolutionary principles I'm going to be talking about will probably be familiar uh, to you, but maybe not in this context. But this is the context that Charles Darwin himself actually used to explain uh, how evolution works. But we're not going to be uh, treating this as a, 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 a textbook sort of thing on evolution. Instead, I'm going to have a look at some uh, preconceptions and prejudices that people have against domesticated animals because we don't take them very seriously, do we? We think they're kind of cute things for the kids, not really things for scientists to take that seriously. We don't actually think of about them uh, in the same context as wild animals. Selective breeding isn't relevant to science, which is a real shame because it is, it absolutely is. Uh, but I do understand that point of view and I call these people wild animal snobs and I know all about them because I used to be one. It hasn't actually always been like that though. People haven't always uh, looked down on domestication animals. Once upon a time, you could open a a book about natural history, a book about birds, for example, and you would see mixed in with the pictures of uh, wild birds, wild species, you'd see all the domesticated varieties as well. You'd see fantails and carriers and jacobins, all domesticated varieties of, of fancy pigeons, mixed in with wood pigeons and morning doves and Victoria crown pigeons. You'd see them mixed in with all the wild species and they would even be given scientific names. Now, that wasn't a mistake. Taxonomy in those days wasn't intended to uh, show uh, 
relationships between animals. It was supposed to be a catalog of what actually exists on the planet. These four birds shown here are all unquestionably pigeons, so therefore they deserve to be in a book about pigeons. Charles Darwin himself actually said that if you were a taxonomist, if you were to look at uh, all the different varieties of fancy pigeons, and looking just at this picture now, you can see that there are some really, really weird ones, uh, all completely different, you would, in all likelihood, actually name those as separate species. Taxonomy, the problem facing taxonomists is like, it can be compared with looking down over a vast tree or a vast forest. You're looking down from above, all you can see are the very, very tops, the very tops of the trees, the, the leaves, the tiniest, tiniest twiglets on that top layer. And you can't tell if those tiny twiglets have attached to bigger twigs or bigger twigs or branches or great limbs or crucially if they're actually attached to the same trunk or not. It's exactly the same with uh, naming animals. All we can see is what is actually uh, in existence at any one time. We don't know what those relationships are. We don't know if they come from one common ancestor or if they come from many ancestors. Now, people uh, keeping animals over the, over the centuries didn't believe that animals couldn't change. Uh, everybody knows that animals can change because we've been improving domesticating animals for many, 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 many years, even since Roman times or before. So we know all about the changes that can come about through selective breeding. What we did think, though, was that uh, all the different varieties that we have currently, your modern fantails, and modern carriers, and modern Jacobins, all came from ancestral versions of the same thing. So putting in, in, in diagrammatic format, lots and lots of straight parallel lines, parallel arrows, the old archetypal version, uh, then evolving, changing into that newer version of the same thing. So definitive types that remain the same right the way through history, uh, so parallel unbranching uh, change. Oopsie. But in fact, we don't have that. All of these varieties, all of these uh, different sorts of animals, wild and domesticated, do actually come from a common stem, do actually come from that common tree trunk underneath the, 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 that canopy of trees. And in the case of these domesticated pigeons, uh, they all actually come from the uh, wild rock dove, the common ancestor of all domesticated pigeons, which is very, very similar. You might recognise there's very similar, in fact, exactly the same as Darwin's Tree of Life. Animals are plastic things, they change. And whereas it might not be possible to see change happening uh, in wild animals, because the change happens, tends to happen so very, very slowly, many human generations even. But in domesticated animals, change can come about in just a few animal generations. So for example, a uh, old fashioned pantail pigeon like this can, did, uh, within just about 30 years, change into the modern equivalent, which is something more like this, something rather more spherical. Yep, animals are plastic things. This is a bull terrier of around about 1900. And over the years, through selective breeding, the muzzle, you can see that the, the actual skull itself doesn't change very much. The actual cranium doesn't change very much. The muzzle rotated down by 1960, and by the present day, rotating down even further. Uh, so you've got that lovely charismatic sort of bent headed look. Uh, Darwin recognised what was happening, what does happen with selective breeding, and he recognised the similarity between breed created by man and evolution of new species under natural selection. I don't know how many of you have read On the Origin of Species, but uh, I first began to try to read it when I was uh, about 16 years old. And I was really disappointed. I thought it was going to be about really cool adaptations in wild animals from, from page one. And instead, I was very disappointed to find that it was just page after page after page of uh, descriptions of domesticated pigeons, which I found really tedious. And I got to about page 15 and closed the book, put it back on the shelf. But Darwin was quite clever uh, comparing natural selection to 
artificial selection, clever to begin with, but with pigeons, which are very popular in Victorian England. And because he was introducing a difficult and frightening concept, really, really scary concept, uh, in some ways even today, he was introducing the idea that all of the marvellous diversity of life on Earth could have come about without a grand plan, without a uh, divine creator. It could have actually come about on its own. He, what he did was show a mechanism where all of this wonderful diversity could come about without that uh, you know, divine hand, which was and is still quite a frightening idea. So that was why he, he, he began his book uh, talking about pigeons and chickens and animals that were familiar to people. To get people in their comfort zone before dropping the bombshell. It worked very, very well indeed. These are the animals that people kept in their gardens that they liked reading about. It was uh, like a spoonful of sugar to make the medicine go down. I've just been talking about natural selection, which was you know, Darwin's theory. It wasn't just a theory, theory of evolution. It's evolution by natural selection and I'm sure most of you know how that works but I'm just going to explain it now very quickly just in case you need a reminder. It works on the premise that all individuals are very very slightly different from each other and that those differences can be passed down from one generation to the next. That's the random part. Uh, the analysis of not here, here's the, the, the non-random part that then in the struggle for existence when there's competition, when the going gets tough, then sometimes those slight differences might actually give competitive edge uh, to one individual over another. And it might just mean that that individual gets to pass those traits down to the next generation. More are born than can survive. You've always got to have a weeding out process. Not every single animal that's born can then uh, even live long enough to grow up. Uh, so there's always going to be that weeding out process. Sometimes it's that difference between one individual and another that makes them, that makes that difference. And then that difference will be passed down uh, to the next generation. So let's look at it in uh, equation terms. We've got variation, not just any variation, but heritable variation, actually random part. And then we've got selection, that's the non-random part. So variation plus selection equals evolution. And that's how it works. It's a beautiful, simple formula. If you take nothing else home with you, apart from one thing though, please let it be this. Survival of the fittest is the most misunderstood, misinterpreted, and downright dangerous phrase in the whole of the history of science. Let's get rid of it now. It's not about survival. It's not about living a long time. It doesn't matter if you live a thousand years if you don't produce any viable offspring. It's not about living a long time. Neither is it about fitness. The problem is that uh, it's always a good thing to be physically fit. The word's taken on a different meaning now. So it's not about being strong, powerful, physically fit, uh, able to sort of bash your opponent and win. It's not about that. It's not about might is right. It's not about uh, aggression or, or dominance. It's actually about being best fitted, not fit, not physical fitness, but best fitted to your environment. And the environment is actually the key word here. And let's think of an example. Uh, suppose you're an animal with the capacity to develop a really, really thick woolly coat, okay? Which is great, isn't it? If it's at the beginning of an ice age. What about if it's the beginning of global warming? That's not so great. So it's all about the environment. Now let's uh, look at that again uh, from a, a domesticated animal context. Now, now okay, it's a, you're an animal with the capacity to grow a long coat, a coat that never ever stops growing. It doesn't molt, it doesn't fall out once a year, it just grows and grows and grows and grows. Now that's going to be a really bad thing if you are a wild animal because it'll get snagged up on bushes, you'll trip over it, uh, lots of bad stuff's going to happen. But if you happen to be a sheep, then it could be a really good thing. 
because a non-glowing, a, 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 a non-shedding coat can actually spark off an entire uh, industry for wool. I mean, that's a really good thing. It's a really good thing for a human, but sheep couldn't really care less about the international woolen industry. All sheep care about is breeding, which is precisely what a non-growing, non, uh, sorry, an ever-growing, non-shedding coat allows them to do, because those will be the sheep, those will be the individuals that are chosen by the sheep keepers, the sheep breeders, to carry on that trait for the next generation. They will be the ones that are allowed to breed, because they, the human owners, want to have that trait. Owners happy, woolen industry very happy, sheep also very happy. So this is the sort of, you know, this is just another environment like any other. It may be a, a man-made environment, maybe what we might call artificial, but it's still an environment that animals find themselves in and it still makes a difference between uh, e evolutionary success or failure. Okay, let's look at the next uh, prejudice. Domesticated animals are just freaks. I'm looking at these little short-faced dogs, you might be inclined to agree with me. But let's face it, there are some pretty freakish things in nature too. When people say to me, look what humans have done to uh, toy dogs, I might say, look what flowers have done to sawbill hummingbirds. There are some pretty freaky things out there and they exist because they can. And for no other reason, the environment is right. You might think that chickens without any feathers on their neck are quite a freaky thing and I mean they're not exactly pretty are they but you might not question it if you're talking about marabou storks or ostriches or vultures or any of the wild many many wild birds that also have a naked neck. Now a naked neck is a useful thing to have in a hot climate. Birds lose heat through their neck because the blood vessels are quite close to the surface. And so it, if it happens, you know, it will happen on its own. Nobody can make this happen. The uh, mutations that cause it to happen are spontaneous and they can happen anywhere in wild animals or in domesticated animals. So if it happens in a, in a bird in a hot climate, then that can be a good thing for losing heat. Now, naked neck chickens uh, are from uh, Romania, which is not a hot climate at all, but it's still a good environment to have a naked neck because chicken fanciers liked it. They just simply thought it was interesting or fun and let's keep this. So the birds are still winning in an evolutionary way, just the same as marabou storks are, because the environment favours that, uh, that trait. Remember, nothing can make this happen. It happens on its own and the environment either favours it or it doesn't favour it at the time. On the subject of chickens, I introduced Peter Bellman, who was a travelling salesman in Iowa in the 1940s. And he, he, he sold veterinary products. That thing there in the way of, I'm not sure if you can see that or not. Yeah, I'll get that out of the way there. Uh, Peter Bauman sold veterinary products to, to farms in uh, America in the 1940s and he was a bit of a weirdo. He was a bit of a weirdo. Uh, he would go around to these farms, a long drive to get there. Farmer would give him a cup of tea and uh, what's, yeah, what's new? And uh, they'd have a chat and the farmer might say, hey, we had a weird chick hatched this morning, come and see. And, uh, Peter Bowman's eyes would light up when the farmer said, he's got no wings, he's got little stunted wings or no wings at all. And Peter would say, hey, hey, could I have it? Could I take it home? Would, uh, would it be okay if I keep it, please? And the, fall, the farmer would roll his eyes and say, yeah, sure, I'll keep it, take it home. And uh, Peter would take these weird birds home and within a few years of highly skilled selective breeding, he actually managed to build up a self-perpetuating flock of entirely wingless chickens. Peter Bellman didn't like chicken wings and he assumed that nobody else did either. But uh, one of his reasons for, for breeding these was, you can see him here in the picture posing over his very, very low fence, his 18 inch high fence. And he uh, thought it would be saving a fortune on, on uh, 
fencing materials by keeping these birds that couldn't actually fly out of their pens. Nobody told Peter Bowman that the reason for fencing in poultry is to keep predators out, and not to keep the chickens in. But, uh, there you have it. So, wingless chickens, pretty gross idea, right? I'm sure you're all out there, usually with a live audience, I'll, I'll say to everyone, who thinks wingless chickens is a gross idea? And then everybody in the audience will put up their hand and say, yes, definitely, it's gross. Well, maybe it is, maybe it's not. Once upon a time, there was a whole race of birds on an island called New Zealand, which may, might be familiar to you, a whole race of birds which were flightless. Uh, there were th about 13 species, uh, the mowers, of course, uh, all entirely flightless. There were no mammalian predators on New Zealand. This was a kingdom of birds, no mammalian predators, nothing could get them. They grew, uh, many of the species grew to a great size and they couldn't fly, they didn't need to fly. Now we found a lot of mower uh, remains, a lot of fossils, a lot of bones, and it could be that, that uh, like many other birds, mowers lost their wings gradually, gradually through many, many, many generations of not needing them. But we found all these fossils, all these remains, and we've never yet found any single part of mower wing anatomy, not the tiniest shard of bone. And of course, it only takes one discovery to, to change all that and to throw my theory into, you know, into, into the dust. But uh, yes, they may have lost their wings through gradual selection, or maybe, just maybe, mowers lost their wings in one fell swoop, one single random mutation, and maybe they're just very large wingless chickens. Oh, mutations. Oh, yeah, people, people don't like the word mutations. They get very upset. Let me just take a glass of water here while I contemplate mutations and how, and how much trouble they got me into talking about the M word. Now, you've only got to mention that M word for people to picture animals with too many legs, too many heads, all sorts of uh, strange stuff wrong with them mad scientists in their white coats and their big goggles laughing and cackling with uh, shelves lined with uh, awful things in uh, pickled in jars you can almost hear the barrel organ can't you roll up roll up come and see the bearded lady well take this home too mutation does not mean monster when we talk about uh, evolutionary mutation genetic mutations we're not talking about things like that now, I'm going to show you a, um, I understand there could be some younger people in the audience, so you might want to close your eyes at this point. Uh, ladies or people with a delicate disposition might want to close their eyes at this point because I'm about to show you a monster. Ready for this? <gasps> yeah, things like four-legged ducklings and six-legged puppies are not mutations in the way that we mean it uh, as uh, evolutionary people. If you were to breed them together, I don't mean the ducks, the puppies, uh, I mean the ducks, the ducks, or the dogs, the dogs. If you were to breed one of these multi-limbed animals with another animal, you would not get anything that weird. You would get just normal ducklings and normal puppies because these sorts of things are almost always just a result of uh, so an accident in cell division in the developing embryo. They're not heritable mutations. So yes, they do occur, but they're not what we mean when we're talking about mutations in an evolutionary sense. What we normally mean are tiny, tiny, indiscernible little mini differences between individuals. Just the almost you know, hardly visible things. You know, the slightest, slightest changes between individuals. And these are just m minor copying errors in DNA and they accumulate over many, 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 many generations over millions of years and stay there in the lineage and uh, get passed on from one generation to the next. But sometimes though, these changes are bigger. What we call uh, macro mutations, single step mutations. What's wrong with this chicken? We well, might not be able to see it from this picture because he's got his feathers on. So let's take the feathers off and look at it now. Yep, this chicken's got very short legs. You might not 
you would see it quite as well because we're used to seeing chickens with a really big breast because you know, chickens have got huge breast muscles. But uh, it's also got, so the wings always look small by comparison, but this chicken has also got very tiny wings. This is a Japanese bantam, which is a disproportionate dwarf. It's got some achondroplasia, which shortens the limb bones, but leaves the rest of the body unchanged. Now, see it in a bird is quite unusual. We're used to seeing it in things like it hounds. There's, it occurs in many, many different animal species, though. Uh, there's a cat version too. Come on, come on. There we are. It's a munchkin cat. They're really cute. They look like otters. They're very sweet. And uh, in case you're thinking it's a bit unkind to uh, deliberately breed short-legged cats, well, we went and spent a whole day uh, with a cat breeder, and there was about 40 of them in the house. And they were just charging around like mad and playing. And trust me, munchkin cats, that's what they're called, munchkins can uh, run up the curtains as well as the next cat. We didn't see any uh, anything that they couldn't do <laughs> when they were charging around with, with the proper sized cats. Yeah, uh, disproportionate dwarfism then can occur in many different species. It's occurred in elephants, foxes, and of course in humans. It's all about the environment, whether the environment favours it or not. And we don't know whether actual animal species or families may, like things like mustelids, the weasels and stoats and otters, we don't know whether uh, early on in their evolutionary history they may have actually had a metaphorical leg up <laughs> by uh, this sort of mutation. It's all about the environment. If the environment favours it, then even macro mutations can actually thrive in the population. Environments come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And when a short-legged sheep was born to a farmer in Massachusetts, actually it wasn't born to the farmer, it was born to a ewe, but uh, when the farmer saw this short-legged lamb, anyway, his eyes lit up and he, just like Peter Bauman, could see all sorts of wonderful possibilities about saving a fortune on repairing fences. Short-legged sheep can't jump over fences. And like Peter Bauman, uh, this farmer uh, actually, yes, he, he, he built up a whole flock of short-legged sheep and they couldn't jump fences and they did really well and they became internationally famous and they actually reached the attention of a young Charles Darwin. Now, they confused the hell out of Darwin because Darwin was constantly stressing the gradual, gradual nature of evolution. He would say, natura non facit sortus, nature does not make leaps. Short-legged sheep uh, couldn't, might not be able to jump fences, but they certainly seem to have made an evolutionary leap to Darwin, which really confused him. He couldn't accept that macro mutations like this could actually play a part in evolution. Richard Goldschmidt, on the other hand, in the 1940s, uh, Germany, he, on the other hand, couldn't see how we could possibly have the diversity that we have of, of, of animal uh, varieties in the world, he couldn't see that, that evolution could have actually come about without macro mutations. He coined the term hopeful monsters uh, and he believed that uh, big major major mutations that actually uh, uh, caused the evolution of, of uh, such a wide variety of different sorts of animals. His theory was met with ridicule at the time but we now know that it may not be so far from the truth. It, it can actually work because sometimes major uh, phenotypic change, major change in the appearance of animals and the outward uh, appearance of animals can actually be due to very, very tiny uh, genetic changes. Just a small step genetically can, can uh, bring about some really big changes in the outside of animals. Take Rex rabbits, for example. Now to bring things back to domesticated animals, we might look at this rabbit and say it's all very nice, very pretty, very attractive, very unusual, but what relevance does this have to evolution? You may have seen Rex rabbits and rabbit shows and normally if you were a live audience I'd get you to put your hands up, who's been to a rabbit show? Who's seen Rex rabbits? But uh, in case you haven't seen them, Rex fur in rabbits is 
the loss of the guard hairs. It's not a different sort of fur, but uh, the directional hairs. If you stroke a rabbit from head to tail, you stroke it from head to tail. If you stroke it from tail to head, the fur goes the wrong way. And that's because of the long guard hairs that overlie the undercoat and the, you know, they, they point in, a, in the tail direction. But if you have a mutation that removes the guard hairs, all you're left with is this lovely, dense, velvety undercoat that doesn't actually have a direction. Now, this might look very nice for a show rabbit, and you might be thinking, what's the point? Well, maybe again, this has happened in evolutionary history, and it's kind of caught on a long, long, long time ago. For example, it might be a really good thing for moles to go up their burrows and go down again without turning around. I love that. I'm going to do that again. Anyhow, <laughs> indulge me. Up their burrows and down again without turning around. It could be that moles have mixed fur just like panty rabbits. Nothing can make these things happen. They happen on their own. They're random mutations. This might look like a very scruffy looking stuffy pigeon and it's very old it, and that's precisely what it is. It is a very scruffy old stuffed pigeon but if you look at the uh, slight twist to those mantle feathers that's not just from being a scruffy old stuffed pigeon that's an actual genuine natural twist to the feathers. Nothing can make that happen and it can happen anywhere. We've actually seen wild pigeons with the same mutation. No amount of selective breeding can cause this, but, but once it happens, then lots of selection for that trait. Breeders choosing the birds with the, with the curliest feathers, uh, with, or with the curliest feathers over more of their body, they can make that more pronounced, more extreme, and then they can bring about change. Charles Darwin, incidentally, used to keep this breed. It's called a, a fillback, and I think Darwin would have been delighted, absolutely delighted, by how they would look in another 150 years. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? Just a uh, random mutation plus many years of selective breeding. Let's look at colour now. Once again, big phenotypic changes can be brought about just by tiny, tiny genetic tweaks. Just a flick of a switch change one thing or another. Now, this is a lovely cat called Boris, uh, who lives in Maine, and he's a macro tabby cat. Now, the tabby stripes are separate from the colour. Tabby is due to a, a, a trait called a duty, which is entirely separate from what we talk about the colour. And so are those little uh, white patches that's through leucism and that's also independent. Now uh, this particular colour in, in tabby cat, a proper wild type tabby cat, has got two melanin pigments. He's got eumelanin which is um, greyish black and he's got pheomelanin which is reddish brown. It's got a mixture of the two. So if Boris had only been born with pheomelanin and no eumelanin he would have been born a ginger cat. Exactly the same stripes, exactly the same little cute white patches, but a ginger cat. Now, if you'd been born instead with just the eumelanin and not the pheomelanin, he would have been a silver tabby. And if he'd had a melanin overdose and had all those uh, gaps filled in, just lots and lots and lots and lots of uh, melanin, he would have been a black cat. Yep, black cats are just tabby cats, the space is filled in. We'll look at a bird example now. Hang on a sec, I'll just have a glass a drink of water. Sorry about that. Okay, the bird example, this is called, let's colour a Gordian finch. Uh, the Gordian finches are tiny Australian finch, uh, Australian finches and they're just really beautiful bright colours you'll see in a moment. Now all of these colour variations can and do occur, and they occur on their own as spontaneous mutations. Just one tiny change genetically to bring about a huge difference in the colour. This is a completely white, white canvas, and you can see all of these different colour variations in a bird show, but they can also equally well occur in the wild. 
So blank canvas, white gaudium finish, no pigment at all. Let's add carotenoids. Carotenoids are red and yellow, red or yellow. So let's add those first. That's nice, very nice. Now we'll add one of those melanin pigments. We'll add eumelanin, the blue black one. There we go. You see where the blue overlies white, it's just blue on the rump and on the, uh, on the face. But where it overlies the yellow on the back, it becomes green. It's exactly like the transparent layers in a watercolour painting or in a silk screen print. Two colours together and you make a third. And now we'll add the uh, fear melanin pigment. But because of the feather structure in uh, Gaudium finches, instead of the fear melanin turning out reddish brown, it turns out lovely rich deep purple. How nice is that? And this is the way Gaudium finches look in the wild. But you can also remove pigments as well. Uh, let's take away the eumelanin, let's take away the carotenoids and pheomelanin. All of these variations can and do occur and they occur all on their own. Now we've uh, looked at the length of bones, we've looked at different flow and feather types, we've looked at colour. Now we'll look at the number of bones. This is a wild boar and that's the wild ancestor of all domesticated pigs. Now, if you were to look in a textbook that describes wild boars in very dull detail, you would see that they have, it would say categorically probably, wild boar have, I think it's 19 thoracic vertebrae. The thoracic ones are the ones in the body, uh, not the ones in the neck, they stay pretty much the same. But the ones in the body, it would say, the wild boar has 19 thoracic vertebrae. And for almost all wild boar, that would be true. But there is a lot of variation between individuals and they can have more or they can have fewer. Now, nobody who breeds pigs would be, uh, it'd be a bit weird when you actually uh, select animals on, it'd be a bit perverse to select animals on, on, on the number of bones in their back. You wouldn't do that. But you would perhaps select pigs on the number of slices of pork you can get out, the numbers of slices of bacon for, for people in the UK, the number of, of the amount of meat that that body actually yields. And the longest bodied pigs that yield the most meat are going to be the ones you're going to be breeding from, because you want more and more meat. And they also happen to be the individuals that happen to have ex those extra thoracic vertebrae. That's why the back's so long. So within a few pig generations, you can get uh, commercial meat breeds like this that have up to 24 thoracic vertebrae. It might seem weird, the sort of thing that you just do to domesticated animals and it seems all wrong, but this can and does happen in nature, in evolution with remarkable ease. It's just a copy and paste action. And another vertebrae, another set of ribs, just copy and paste. And big changes can come about by very, very, very simple uh, genetic tweaks. Just a flick of a switch. Animals should be fit for the purpose they were bred for. Now, the dog show fraternity and the working dog fraternity do tend to hate each other. And working dog people like to say that, that animals should be fit for the purpose they were bred for. And okay, there, there, there have been quite a few. Uh, show dogs which are no longer uh, potentially fit for that and sometimes the detriment of the dog which is awful so you can understand the argument. The dog shown here is a bulldog and the skull draw from bulldogs and you can see that they are all entirely different from each other. The only one of these dogs which would have actually been able to work uh, to do the purpose to do the thing it was bred for is actually the top one which looks nothing like the bulldog that we know today. In, term, in bulldog terms, uh, the job that they were bred for ended in the early 19th century by a, an act of parliament in, in England, which banned uh, bullfighting, oh, sorry, uh, bull baiting by dogs, which is a good thing for the bulls, a really good thing for the dogs, uh, and you know, a good move all around. There was a, the same act also banned cockfighting, which again was, you know, nobody wants to, to, to see uh, this sort of you know, cruel sport going on. So it was excellent that that got banned. But what does that actually mean for the breeds in question? 
Well, let's have a look at the uh, the, the what happened to the, the fighting cocks afterwards. Uh, chicken uh, enthusiasts no longer able to actually breed chickens for the uh, fighting arena, still kept chickens, but now. Uh, the same breed was, was, was divided into two. Another branch of that phylogenetic tree, some people said, let's keep it fit for purpose. Other people said, let's see what this breed can do. And they would breed it more and more beautiful, more and more elegant and leggy and uh, just long necked. To hell with the original purpose, let's breed for aesthetics alone. Versus hypothetically fit for the original purpose. And you've got that branch of the evolutionary tree, you've got one breed, one fighting breed, fit for purpose, now dividing into two different branches, two completely different uh, varieties, which is uh, very similar to the way uh, speciation comes about, uh, comes about in the uh, phylogenetic tree. Working animals unemployed, what's going to happen? They could become extinct or they can go on. And in the case of uh, bulldogs, they were no longer working, therefore they're just put in the show ring against each other. And what happens is because the winners are going to be the ones selected for breeding and the losers aren't, and it's an ongoing thing. Always, always, you're going to get change. The strange thing is that the breed standards are brought about to keep animals constant, but it actually does the opposite. The act of showing animals, the act of uh, exhibition, you know, the exhibiting animals actually keeps them constantly, constantly changing. So even though the show si uh, system is, is designed to have the archetypal perfect representatives of a breed, in actual fact, it's like turning the thermostat off on a heater and watching the temperature soar up one degree at a time. It's like a carrot on the end of a, on the end of a stick, always keeping that uh, ideal further and further and further away from what's actually attainable. And this is what happens. Rapid, unavoidable, runaway evolution. There is nothing you can do about it in the current uh, dog showing uh, and, and animal exhibition system. It's no matter how hard you try, with the best of intentions in the world, resistance is futile. You will get runaway evolution exactly as you do and exactly comparable with sexual selection in nature and arms race selection where you've got the gazelles and the cheetahs constant change constantly moving constantly wanting you know, being pushed uh and pushed forward all the time domesticated animals are all in bed yeah, this is a common thing that we uh, level against uh selective breeding and it's not always as simple as that we tend to say inbreeding is bad. Well, inbreeding isn't always bad. Let's have a look at wild animals, for example. Uh, nobody ever criticizes inbreeding when we're talking about animals such as the, the uh, uh, Mauritius kestrel, brought back from the brink of extinction from seven individuals, I think. Great, fantastic triumph for uh, uh, conservation. Galapagos finches and other island species are all descended from waifs and strays washed up on bits of floating vegetation they are all in bed and island animals tend to be very uh, resistant to this and they, they can uh, have their numbers brought down to next to nothing and then bounce back they've been doing it a long time and uh, inbreeding isn't necessarily a bad thing for those neither is it necessarily a bad thing in domesticated animals either the great uh, english agriculturalist robert bakewell swore by the practice of what he called breeding in and in because if you've got the harmful traits in the background in your genes which aren't showing themselves the best thing you can possibly do is to put those animals with other closely related animals and then the two recessive genes might might uh, actually be they might get together and of course then the trait is expressed in the living animal and then you can get rid of it you can eliminate it from the population so inbreeding, when it's coupled with ruthless culling and ruthless removal of those individuals, it can actually be really good. Once you've got those traits showing, get them out and then you know, you've got rid of them. We tend to uh, paint 
readers with quite you know with rather, rather badly in many cases especially when we know, you know, know about uh, so many genetic diseases in modern dog breeds it is an awful shame but uh, and yes there are some unscrupulous breeders out there that will do uh, a lot of inbreeding for profit and however I think a, a lot of the problems many of the problems that we that the dogs actually suffer now are not the result of unscrupulous breeding practices they're a result of a genetic bottleneck during uh, times when those the numbers of individuals of each breed brought down to a bare minimum for example during wartime during world war ii very 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 uh unpopular thing to actually keep uh dogs for example uh, you're going to get a brick through your window you know wartime foods rationed uh people keeping you know big meat-eating animals they're not going to be very popular so the numbers of dog breeders was reduced the numbers of dogs was reduced this dog here is a sussex spaniel and that was reduced down, reduced down to eight individuals remember this is a time when uh people knew very little about genetics and all they were doing was actually trying to save the breeds that they cared about they were fanciers really determined to to keep these breeds going and yes there are some unscrupulous breeders now but i think a lot uh, a lot of the time these problems that we're, we're seeing now are historical problems due to that genetic bottleneck and i think we really need to give those breeders a break and sometimes just sometimes inbreeding does absolutely no harm whatsoever this is where I normally ask a live audience, how many of you have ever had or have or have ever had a golden hamster as a pet? And everybody puts their hand up. And then I'll say, did you know that all your hamsters are related? And some do, some don't. Set up a Facebook group. Yep. All domesticated golden hamsters in the world are the descendants of a single pregnant female. They're all aunts and uncles and cousins and great cousins and great 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 grandparents and, and sons and daughters and there's nothing wrong with them they go on forever they still breed prolifically they go under the little wheels they, they're very active little things they stuff their faces full of you know their pouches full of food and they're, they're jolly little things uh they're not biting you and they just go on forever breeding and breeding there's no genetic diseases there's no loss of fertility there's no loss of fecundity. They just carry on reproducing more and more and more hamsters. So remember this, next time somebody says inbreeding is universally bad, remember the golden hamster. They wouldn't survive in the wild. That's a common one. And people are really fond of saying that. What they really mean is they wouldn't survive without man. Is that such a problem? I mean, look at the look at us all. And these are just the ones with electricity. Man is going nowhere. The human environment is the major environment on the planet, and it will continue to be so, uh, probably increasingly. Uh, I'm not saying it's good, but there will probably be small dogs walked in uh, parks, in town parks, long, long, long after the last wolf has been uh, wiped out. Unfortunately, that will still uh, be a, a triumph for Canis lupus being the same species but uh, I'm not saying it's good but what I mean is that uh, it wouldn't survive in the wild is not really a very valid argument. The human environment is just an environment like any other and there are many wild animals too which are adapting to it very nicely. Uh, So-called tame, tame animals in cities even things like hyenas. It, the question is is this tameness which uh, is learned from their surroundings, from their parents, from their social groups, or is this genetic tameness? Is this something that they're born with? One of these random traits that, that you know, can be a very good thing in the right environment. Now, one man who felt that that was the case, Dmitry Beriev, uh, he felt that there was such a thing as genetic tameness. And he conducted an experiment on uh, silver foxes in Siberia to, to, to find out. Now, he wasn't actually taming his foxes. He wasn't petting them. He wasn't uh, being kind of some. Uh, he just kept these foxes in the same conditions. And the ones which uh, shied away or were aggressive, they'd be the ones that were turned into fur coats. And the ones that were chilled, laid back, or actually uh, affectionate, 
they'd be the ones that were kept and passed and his traits on to the next generation. And within a very, very few number of fox generations, uh, the majority of Belief's foxes were actually tame, which which does strongly suggest that, that uh, genetic tameness is a trait, is a single trait that animals can be spontaneously born with. What Belief didn't expect was a whole suite of other side effects, uh, tameness, white patches, broccoli ears, uh, curly tails, kept uh, longer into their in, in maturity, which bring, raises questions of whether there is such a thing as a, a domestication phenotype and whether humans ourselves might be uh, self-domesticated. My book, my talk doesn't really deal with that, but uh, it was worth mentioning uh, anyway. A while ago we talked about the equation for uh, how natural selection works and we mentioned inheritance. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk about that now, but inheritance was Darwin's sticking point. He'd already spent uh, 20 years coming up with that beautiful equation and inheritance, how the variation occurs, where it comes from, how those traits have passed down to the next generation were things that he uh, hadn't worked out yet. And I, I believe that he would have happily carried on for another 20 years and just uh, sorted out those problems first before publishing. But then something happened to spur Darwin into action. And that something was a letter he received from a young naturalist in the Malay archipelago, Alfred Russell Wallace. Now Darwin has slaved, her, slaved and sweated over this lovely equation for 20 years. Wallace came up with the answer in one fit of malarial fever. Uh, Darwin was horrified. And so, to cut a long story short, he uh, published on the origin of species quite quickly for him and promised to come back with a later book about how that uh, dealing with the problem, where the variation comes from and how those traits are passed down for the next generation. The book he came back with was Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication. It's a big book and it's really not very nice to read. It's a wonderful compendium of facts about selective breeding, but the problem is he actually gets his uh, conclusion very wrong. He came up with a theory which was deeply flawed. But you've got to give Darwin four marks for trying because he he worked so hard on this. He sent out questionnaires, he, he wrote to people, he bombarded them with letters, he demanded specimens from them, plead, pleaded and begged for specimens from them. He wrote, to, he wrote letters to just about every breeder of uh, domesticated plants and animals uh, everything from the humblest garden, everyone from the humblest gardener to the most aristocratic racehorse breeder. He missed, he missed one. He missed one person, one person who could have actually, who actually held the key to the questions and to the answers that he sought. That one person was a monk uh, breeding pea plants in a monastery garden in Brno, in Czechoslovakia. The monk, of course, was Gregor Mendel. My book, A Natural Selection, celebrates the 150th anniversary of Darwin's variation under domestication, and it's intended to be a tribute to what Darwin might have actually achieved if things had gone just a little bit differently. If I may, I'll just conclude with a bit of stuff about the making of the book. Uh, Darwin took four, month, four years and two months of hard, uh, he described his book as four years and two months of hard labor. Well, mine was six years. <laughs> Do I have enough time? Yes, you do. Oh, I thought it was going to be enough. Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks. Mine was six years and two months of hard labour. And I did many of the things that Darwin did. I, I visited lots of animal breeders, uh, went to see lots of captive things on farms and uh, in households. Lots of geese, there's some crested geese here. We went to uh, Belgium to learn about double muscling in cattle. Visited lots of pigeon breeders and saw lots of different traits and domesticated pigeons. We keep pigeons too, and husband's been breeding pigeons uh, all his life, but we look like to see lots more pigeons. Uh, learned all about uh, long-tailed fowl, and, and it, believe me, it takes a really, really special sort of chicken with the capacity to develop a 27-foot long tail. I had horse skeletons put together for me in New York State, and I got to play with lots of lovely munchkin cats and kittens. 
visited lots of museums and uh, big specimens and information from lots and lots and lots of people. There we are, museums, specimens and information, and in the States too. My previous book, The Unfeathered Bird, was a book mostly about bird skeletons, and we prepared those skeletons actually at home, and we continue to prepare all the specimens at home. They'd be boiled up on the stove in our kitchen. Uh, we've got a tiny little house, and husband will be downstairs boiling up the actual dead things. Before you know, for The Unfeathered Bird, it could be it was just birds. This time, it could be anything from ducks to dachshunds. Then he put together the skeletons on our tiny, tiny little dining room table, piled higher with papers and coffee cups and wine glasses and pets. The dog was actually on the table, uh, but she's quite close. It's kind of chaotic. The stuff that husband does for me is, is, is amazing. Not only uh, does he put together the skeletons uh, that are right for that uh, particular species, but also for the breed, the variety, and that, that variety of the right period of history. There are not many more, there are not many other people in the world, I think, that could do what he's done. He's got a very, very uh, advanced knowledge of domesticated animals and anatomy. Meanwhile, I'd be upstairs doing the writing and the drawing. Uh, as the drawings were completed, I would cross the numbers off on the wall, and gradually, gradually, and for all those years, six years, I had a lot of numbers crossed off on the wall. The book's got 425 pictures in and uh, 87,000 words of text. It's a lovely big copy table sized book, but it's not a copy table book. It doesn't really fit any niche. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful work of art and science. Uh, it's got a picture on every single double page, or at least one picture, usually a lot more, on every single double page right the way through the book. And they're lovely. Uh, the pictures are actually done in pencil, but I changed them into this nice sepia colour to make them look more soft, uh, more historical, and just a bit more accessible. And chose the uh, paper colour to be this nice uh, ivory coloured you know, background, which is, uh, I'm so proud, of, it, might, it might sound big headed when I say it's lovely, but I'm just so proud of my book. I, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply in love with it. I designed it all too. I did little flat plans of the whole design and layout of every single page through the whole book. But all of that stuff is is, is you know the sort of thing that anyone can do on their, their own book. What went behind this was the breeding, the actual experiments that uh, that we conducted at home. I can't take the uh, credit for this. I mean, husband's been doing this all of his life. He doesn't breed animals for exhibition or for racing or anything like that. He breeds them just to see uh, how things inherit, uh, how the genetics work and uh, investigating the sort of mutations that can actually occur. Things like what would happen if you put a leucistic ringneck pheasant with a white silky chicken? Will the offspring be white? Is leucism actually uh, the same gene in both species, but you know, both, gen both genera? And the answer is no, because this is what we've got out. Uh, one of the experiments with naked neck pigeons. The naked neck only actually happens if the pigeon is red. Genetically red or yellow, which is pretty cool. And wonderful breeding experiments with sort of silky feather mutation in pigeons, which has got connotations for thermoregulation in bird feathers in general. I can't take the credit for any of that. It's all husband stuff. He's been doing it all of his life. He came along into my life at the tail end of the unfeathered bird, put together about 100 skeletons for that. And as a way of thanking him, I then produced uh, unnatural selection uh, on his uh, real specialism, on his great uh, favourite subject. It was a way of thanking him. I think by the end of it, he was saying, actually, no, Courtney, you, you brought me about 10 times as much work. Please don't thank me in future. <laughs> <laughs> And the Unfeathered Bird was dedicated to a, a dead duck called Amy, and you need to come to one of my other talks to find out why. But of course, unnatural selection had to be dedicated to husband, naturally. Here he is as a little boy, and some things never change. <laughs> finally, just in case you're wondering what happened to that uh, four-legged duckling I showed you earlier. Well, she's now all grown up. She's now in possession of only two legs. She's called Quad. She lives in our back garden, she's alive and well, and uh, she's a very, very much loved part of the family. Thank you very, very much indeed. Ah, thank you very much, Katrina. We have a few questions. 
for you. I did post your website in the comment section on featheredbird.com. And I wanted to tell everyone that I have a copy of your book and people are saying your work is fabulous and your website's very informative. And I'm so glad you talked about how you made your book because obviously you know the history and the what you explained about artificial selection was well articulated, but your skill in drawing all those 400 and some skeletons is amazing. Thank you. Thanks. So the first question is from Bertha. Have you heard of Francis Arnold? Dr. Arnold won fame and the Nobel Prize for developing a technique called directed evolution, which is a way of generating a host of novel enzymes and other biomolecules that can be put to a number of uses. Have you I, heard of that? Uh, I think uh, molecular technology is my great strength. So uh, I don't really, uh, I don't know a great deal about him, but I have vaguely heard, but I'm not really a molecular sort of, uh, I'm more of a Men uh, Mendelian rather than a molecular sort of. Uh, gotcha. So she was talking about how he uh, studied detoxifying a chemical spill or uh, disrupting a mating dance of an agriculture pest by this directed evolution. So that'd be interesting to... I shall read up. I shall read up. Bertha also would like to have a pet Rex for a rabbit. <laughs> and uh, Logan asked about can evolution, natural or unnatural, be in personality or in intelligence? And that was before you were started talking about the Siberian foxes and yeah. how people prefer personalities. Yes, absolutely. Uh, obviously, I, I was dealing mostly with uh, sort of morphology and behavior is a, is a whole new ball game. But, but yes, mm -hmm. same, the same, uh, same law yeah. actually can be applied to both. So in your book, I know that you drew a few animals with feathers and fur, but I yeah. was wondering why did you find it important to focus on the bones and the skeletons? I tried to make a good balance of whole animals and anatomical things. I think after the unfeathered bird, people were expecting it to be about the anatomy of domesticated animals, but it had to be about evolution. Uh, the only way that, that the book would have made sense was in the same context, that lovely analogy that Darwin made between how uh, natural selection works and artificial selection works. And that was the sensible way to actually tackle this book. Uh, especially since the 150th anniversary of variation and domestication was coming up just when I'd be kind of finishing it. So it, it absolutely had to be about that. And it would have been a really one-sided uh, thing to have just done the anatomy. So I wanted it to be about all aspects, the color, uh, you know, different fur and feather types, which meant I had to actually show the whole animals as well as the anatomy. Uh, but uh, as we saw from the talk, uh, there are a lot of these mutations that affect bone length, bone number, as well as fur and feather and color. So uh, I, I think, I hope I actually got a fairly well-rounded uh, mix of, of different parts of animals that can be changed. Yeah. He says that he loves your work environment, which these skeletons were articulated in. It shows how much of a labor of love it was. Uh, thank you. And in your book, I think you mentioned your biggest skeleton in your house? And what was that? Can you uh, share? There was a cow skeleton under the table for a while. That's now actually in the loft, uh, but we going to go back to uh, a taxidermist in the Netherlands who, uh, who uh, owns it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really tiny house. I mean, it's really, really small. Uh, the cow skeleton wasn't put together yet, but we had it put together. And then I ended up using one from a museum instead. So we had this, sort of uh, cow skeleton in various big cardboard boxes waiting to be put together <laughs> and, um, under the television table for a long time. <laughs> that sounds like a very interesting house. Oh, there's bones everywhere. It's completely chaotic. <laughs> I'm actually thinking about building an extension off up back here uh, just for more room for the skeletons. Yeah. It's a bit crazy. <laughs> nice. All right, we have two more questions. One is, are you doing any book touring in the US? I've been. I've been. I You're finished. 
Yeah, but if but I uh, I might be going back next year because I've got some uh, research to do for my next book, and I need to go to various museums in the US to draw some dinosaurs and fossil birds. So if I can do some talks uh, while I'm there, then I will. So very shortly, I'll be printing out you know, sort of, uh, uh, schedule saying, if you want me to give a talk in your US museum or, or wherever, please let me know. <laughs> Wonderful. And that ties into the uh, last question. What will be your next project over the coming years? I adore your books. And that's from Laura Greenwood. Oh, she's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next project I've already started. Uh, it's a second edition of The Unfeathered Bird, but it's going to be completely different. It's uh, The Unfeathered Bird had 304 pages, same as our natural selection, but uh, the new edition is going to be 400 pages. So a big extra chunk, and it's going to include loads more stuff about bird evolution, uh, dinosaurs, what birds are, what birds aren't, and uh, lots of stuff about convergence and, uh, yeah. ah, and very it, good. lots and lots more pictures. Uh, the text is going to be completely rewritten, so it'll be like an entirely new book. Well, thank you very much, Katrina, for talking for us today. Her book, Unnatural Selection, is available on her website. And, oh yeah, the, the links to the where you can find the book, yeah. uh, like Amazon, and where all major books are sold, is yeah. on her website. And uh, thank you very much, Katrina. A pleasure. Thank you all for, for tuning in. That's really kind. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.